Hi guys, my name is Andres. I'm the pastor for Coastal en Español. And today I have the privilege to be sharing the word of the Lord with you guys today. Um, as I was getting ready for uh, this sermon, uh, I was sitting right there listening to Aaron's sermon, making sure that my sermon and his sermon really matched up. And as he was talking about uh, evangelism and how we need to share the gospel and how we should make uh, the gospel a priority in our lives, I was listening to the sermon and I was thinking two things. The first one was, good luck, Andres, following that sermon. I hope that was a really good one. <laughs> and then the second one was, why is it that I don't share my faith more with the people around me? And uh, I started thinking a little bit about this, and I think uh, we all, when we hear these evangelistic sermons, we feel the same thing. We feel conviction by the, wor by the word. We know we need to share the word, but we also feel a sense of uh, we're scared of rejection, and we are overwhelmed sometimes by what could happen if we share our faith. Or you might be somebody who is still struggling with your relationship with uh, Christ and see yourself as still not fit to share the word because you kind of don't have it all together. But I suspect that we all have the same thing in common. Um, we're, we're scared of the fear of rejection, and uh, sometimes that can overwhelm us and bring us to be quiet when we know we should be speaking up. So my question is, is the gospel worth sharing, overcoming that fear? Is it worth it? In the example that I'm going to give to you guys today, um, we are going to read about a man who uh, shares something that people are not ready for. So in, uh, in July 1st, 1818, in the old Austrian Empire, in the city of Buda, Hungary, uh, which eventually became Budapest, Hungary, was born a doctor. His name was Inscreen Simowise. Simowise worked as a doctor in Geneva General Hospital. And in 1847, he noticed that he had a very high mortality rate in his hospital compared to births that were performed in, at home by midwives. He theorized that this death toll could be lowered if surgeons would just wash their hands in between patients. His theory was correct. Greeted with such an easy way to reduce mortality, obviously you would think his fellow practitioners welcomed his research. Well, if you thought that, you're wrong. Uh, when Samuel Weiss talked to his practitioners about his findings and about his theory, uh, they disregarded him and accused him of calling them dirty. Uh, Samuel Weiss uh, was, very, uh, was very distraught uh, to the point where later on in his life he had a nervous breakdown uh, because of all the rejection he was feeling by his colleagues. His colleagues took this opportunity to take him and put him in the insane asylum. There he would die uh, due to uh, injuries he, he received from a beating from the guards at the uh, insane asylum. It wasn't until 20 years later, after the research from Louis Pasteur's germ theory came out, that people were more inclined to wash their hands. Sadly for Samuel Wise, he was proven right, but far, far too late. Have you ever felt like this doctor? Have you ever felt rejected, even though you know you're right? Have you ever felt like you're in the right, but everybody around you seems to attack you? In today's, in today's uh, verse, we're going to see how sometimes, even though we are correct, we can still find ourselves ridiculed and rejected by the people around us because of our faith. So if you have your Bibles, open it to the 14th chapter of the book of Acts. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. The words will be up on the screen. So just a little context so you know where we are. So in today's text, Paul and Barnabas have gone into Iconium and they start preaching the word of the Lord boldly. The Lord has given them grace to do great signs and wonders. And this is creating a problem with the local Jews. And these Jews are stirring plans against the brothers, and they had a plan to stone Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas flee to Lystra, and that is where we're going to pick up in verse 8. So, in Lystra, a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet, had never walked, and was lame from birth. He listened as Paul spoke. 
after looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he jumped up and began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lithuanian language, uh, in the Lithuanian, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was outside of the town, brought bulls and weirs to the gates because he intended with the crowd to offer sacrifice. The apostle Barnabas and and Paul tore their robes when they heard this and rushed into the crowds shouting, people, why are you doing these things? We are people also just like you. We are proclaiming the good news to you that you turn away from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in it. In past generations, he allowed all nations to go their, way, their own ways. Can you imagine this? How Paul and Barnabas, they're out there, they're preaching the word of Christ, and they, they're probably like uh, talking to each other, oh man, that was a really good sermon. Did you see all the crowds? Oh, can you imagine all these people are coming to Christ? And then they're all happy, and then they get down from where they're preaching, and then they get among the people, and they say, hey, there goes Zeus, there goes Hermes. And they're like, you guys didn't understand anything of what we were saying. Absolutely nothing. Sometimes when we're spreading the gospel, we will be misunderstood like Paul and Barnabas in this story. In this Paul, in this verse, Paul and Barnabas are preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles of Lystra, but they could not understand what Paul and Barnabas were talking about. What you have to understand is that the people of Lystra are used to pantheon of gods, meaning the belief that they ha- there could be many gods. And Paul and Barnabas were talking about monotheism, which is the belief in the one true God. They just could not get that into their heads. So when the people of Lystra called Barnabas uh, and, and Paul, you know, Zeus and... Um, Zeus and... Uh, Hermes, thank you. <laughs> it was not a stretch for them. It was, it was just very easy for them. They wanted to understand the gospel, but it was just too strange of a concept for them. So why do we have to understand? We got to understand that people want to understand us. They want to understand why we're so passionate about sharing this gospel with them, but they just don't have what it takes, the knowledge to understand why this is so important. Just think about it. The world is based on merit. Everything is merit-based. But the grace of God is just free. It is without merit. This is a strange concept for the people of the world. It is by grace and grace alone that our, that our sins are forgiven. I run into this problem all the time when I go back to Colombia. My, uh, my uncle, he's a philosophy teacher at one of uh, the universities back home. And uh, whenever I tell him, you know, it is by grace and grace alone that you can have eternal life in Christ, he always laughs at me. And he says, it's like those are the magic words to get into heaven. And it, and it really hurts because my, my uncle, I, I love him so much, but he just does not understand the gospel He doesn't understand that if he accepts Christ, he will go to heaven. But because he doesn't understand that, he he will be apart from there. Now, I know what he's doing. He's trying to take my argument and make it ridiculous. Um, And and it it hurts. And I I know that that he's just doing it out of of ignorance. And sometimes that, that hurt can lead to discouragement. But I cannot let that happen. The gospel is far too important. And look at what the apostles did instead of just accepting the fact that the people did not understand. They corrected them. They went to the crowd and said, we are just people too. It would be much easier for them to just stand back 
and accept the worship of the people, but instead they corrected them, showing them tremendous amount of love by doing so. When we are sharing the gospel, we will be misunderstood, but we must take the time to correct the people that we're sharing the gospel to. We got to understand that not everybody comes from the same background that we come from. Understanding, understanding people's background is very important. We don't all come from the same background. What, the concept that I share with you that is clear to you might not be clear for somebody else because they come from a different place. Let's take, for example, Thanksgiving. When I say Thanksgiving to you guys, you guys think, what? Easy. Food, John Wayne and the Pilgrims. Very easy concept for you guys to understand. But in, uh, in South America... When I talk to them about Thanksgiving, they have no idea what I'm talking about. They have absolutely, in, in Costa and Espanol, it's hilarious. We're going to have a, a Thanksgiving, uh, Friendsgiving, right? And we're all going to bring different types of food. And um, they all come to me and they ask me, like, what's the appropriate food to bring to Thanksgiving? And I'm just like, no, it's, it's the, I, that's not the idea. Let's just bring whatever we like and we're going to give thanks for, uh, for, uh, for what the Lord has done to us. Most foreign people just think Thanksgiving is an excuse to eat good food. They don't know the context. They don't know the ideas. They don't know what is behind Thanksgiving. That's why it's important to understand where people come from. It's not that they don't want to understand, but that they don't have the knowledge to be able to understand. And that is, what, that is exactly what is happening in this story. The Gentiles want to understand what Paul and Barnabas are talking and preaching about, but they cannot understand this concept. This concept is too strange for them. They just can't understand it. So then we pick up the story again in verse 19. And uh, so they're preaching, they get into the people, they find that the people really don't understand what's going on, and this is what happens. Some Jews come from Antioch and from Iconium, and they won over the crowds, and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After his disciples gathered around him, he got up and went into town. The next day, he left with Barnabas to Darby. That went bad really fast. <laughs> he, went, he went from them worshiping him to him getting stoned. But I, I want you to pay attention to the verse because it says, some Jews from Antioch and from Iconium. Where is this story taking place? Lystra. So these people are coming from around just to get in the way of Paul and Barnabas. These Jews are coming from around the towns and coming and taking advantage that the people don't know what's going on to work against Paul and Barnabas. My second point comes from that, and it is that sometimes when you are doing good, people are going to work against you. And how we're going to understand that is through the relationship of Paul and the Jews. And how these Jews were working actively against him. These Jews did not want to rebuke Paul. They didn't want to debate him. They didn't want to do anything else but to kill him and get rid of him. These Jewish leaders knew exactly who Paul was. He had worked for them. He had worked for their cause. He had been a person that they loved and revered. But all of a sudden, Paul had become everything that they hated. You add to this that he keeps talking and talking and talking about this Jesus Messiah who goes against everything that these leaders are teaching in the synagogues. And the cherry on top of all this is that he is using their own text to show them that Jesus is the king. He is the Messiah. And these Jews could just, they could not stand it. They did everything in their power to get rid of Paul. So they did what people do when they are jealous and they feel attacked. They attacked back. They used their power of persuasion and turned all the Jews and all the Gentiles who were believing in the gospel to turn on Paul. Sometimes it's the people who are closest to us 
who will work against us when we are sharing the gospel. These people are the ones who know us from before, and they remind us of all the things we did and the person that we were before the gospel. When, when this happens, we're left hurt, and, and, and we, we're, we're silent, and we, we ask ourselves, why is this happening to us? We're left speechless, and just, why? Why are you doing You should be happy for me. I'm happy now. I found the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But the truth is that, yeah, they're working against us. So what are we supposed to do in these times when we're doing the right thing, but people are actively working against us? The first thing we should do is take a look inside of us and see how we're going about doing the right thing. When I am spreading the gospel, am I spreading it with love or am I doing it out of spite? Am I doing it to try and prove that I'm right and you are wrong? Or am I doing it in a loving manner? But if after you do that, after you take the time to be self-critical and look at your, yourself in the eyes of the Lord and you see that you're doing the right thing, then you need to push on. I know this sounds cliche, but when you're spreading the gospel, the true liberating gospel of Jesus Christ, the devil is not happy. He is not happy when you are with your family and you take the time to talk to the, that, that uncle that doesn't understand the gospel. He's not happy there. He's not happy there when you're with your friends and you guys are watching the game and you guys talk about the gospel. He's not happy there. He's not happy when you talk to your co-worker about Jesus Christ, who is the true liberator. He's not happy there. He's not happy when we are sharing the gospel. We see this all over scripture. Paul himself writes to us in Ephesians, for, my str- uh, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the, author- the authorities, against the cosmic powers of darkness, against evil, uh, against spiritual forces in the heaven. He is not happy. Satan is not happy when we are sharing the true liberating gospel of grace of Jesus Christ. But brothers, sisters, you need to take strength at this time because even though forces are working against you, I have great news for you. Your Lord is powerful and he is mighty and he is there for you during those times. During those times of struggle, when you feel adversity, he is there and he will give you the strength that you need to overcome those difficulties. And this is exactly what Paul and Barnabas uh, decide to do. They could have just gone home. They could have just said, hey, you know, these people are just not ready. They try to stone me. They try to uh, get rid of me. I just should leave this place. But no, they push on. They push on to, because they knew that the people of Lystra, the people of Iconium, and the people of Antioch were dead, and they had no idea. They knew that they were saved. They knew that they had accepted the true gospel of Jesus Christ and that they were saved. But they also knew that these people were not saved, and they decided that that was not okay They decided to follow the instructions of Jesus Christ to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, no matter what was in front of them and who was working against them. So after they leave, they they go and they start getting the church leaders together. And in verse 22, it tells us, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. This one's rough for me. I wish I could just tell you this one's out of uh, context. Um, This is only for them. This is, but it's not. As a, follower, uh, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we will run into hardships because of our faith. 
Like we talked about, this is a strange gospel to the world. They don't want to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. They actively reject it. Sometimes when I'm very bored, I promise, when I'm very bored, I get on YouTube and see how those uh, street preachers go out there preaching the word of Christ, right? And the horrible reactions that people have to the world or to the word of Jesus Christ, they're like, they're like devils out there. They're like, no, no, you can't talk about that. This is our university and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow. If we were just talking about basketball, like it wouldn't be that bad. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you will find hardships because of that. As you leave this place, you need to take to, into consideration that you are a special person. You, are a, uh, you were chosen by Jesus Christ to be part of his family. Because of the grace of God and the sacrifice that Jesus made on that cross, you will now be considered a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ. You are one of his chosen people. You can be sure that you will spend eternity with the Lord. You should rejoice in that fact. And you should know that that is an honor. But that honor comes with a responsibility. Your responsibility as one of the chosen people of the Lord is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Yes, this Thanksgiving, if you share your testimony with your uncle who is against the gospel, you might ruin a couple of conversations. This Christmas, when you tell Bent, Aunt, uh, Bent Betty that you love Jesus and that she needs to love Jesus too, you might get a dirty look. But it is okay. It is okay. You're actually showing them love. The most loving thing you can do to somebody is to show them the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most hateful thing you can do is to stay silent. So after they gather the, uh, the disciples and all the church leaders, they get together and after they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported all the things God had done with them. And he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. The result of what these two men did was that the people of Iconium and all the towns around them got to know Jesus Christ. What they did was giant. They were able to establish church leadership that eventually helped the people of the region know and follow Jesus, know the good news of Jesus. All the struggles, all the pain, all the ridicule, all the adversity all led up to this point. The people around them were dead, but now will have eternal life in him. And at this moment, those people of those, of those towns are in the presence of the Lord because those two guys took the time to spread the gospel. This is what we need to do as a congregation. Our jobs are important. Our hobbies are important. What we like to do is important. But the most important thing that you can do is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are literally spreading Life. You are literally spreading life. That person that you have in your head will be eternally away from our God if you don't take the time to present them the gospel. Imagine a really a long rope. They came from this wall all the way to Houston. And imagine the most tiniest piece of tape and put that right in the middle. That is our life here on this earth. And the rest of the rope is the eternity that we will spend with our Father. Yet, we only want to think about that little part. Oh, no, no, I don't want to talk about the gospel at Thanksgiving, at Christmas. No, it's going to make things awkward. You know how he is, blah, blah, blah. We need to do it. It is the most important thing. Yes, it's important to share 
the gospel when we go on mission trips. But it is more important for you to share it with the person who's next to you. As I was thinking about this, I was just thinking about how we just serve a higher purpose. We just serve a higher purpose. We serve a higher God. And, and how, how loving it is to share the gospel of Christ. And, and I, I know I said it before, but how hateful it is to just stay silent. It's like having the antidote to everybody's sickness and just keeping it to yourself. So this week, as you're reflecting, as you write down that person's name, who you know you need to spread the gospel with, I pray that you pray that the Holy Spirit leads you to that person and that you go in love and you spread the gospel to them. And if the conversation goes sideways, if, you, if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, just know that it's all worth it. No matter if you try a hundred times, and only one person comes to Christ, it is worth it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your gospel that liberates us and give us, gives us eternal life, Lord. Thank you for everything that you have given us, and thank you because of your grace, we will spend eternity with you. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. We are your servants. Send us, Lord. Send us to our neighbors. Send us to our friends. Thank you for everything. In your name we pray. Amen.